Yes, last week when I was doing some traveling, I was reading a passage in the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna where he's having this conversation with um, a an actor who is asking him about self-realization. And they have this short little interchange, and I've read it before, but it struck me really different in a way that got me quite excited. And I've been wanting to share this for a while, but because of all this stuff and things going on, I haven't had a chance, and so here I am. <coughs> the master to the actor. You asked me about self-realization. Longing is the means for self-realization, for realizing the Atman. A man must strive to attain God with all of his body, with all of his mind, and with all of his speech. Because of an excess of bile, one gets jaundice, and then one sees everything as yellow. One perceives no color but yellow. Among you actors, those who take only the roles of women acquire the nature of a woman. By thinking of a woman, your ways and thoughts become womanly. Just so, by thinking day and night of God, one acquires the nature of God. The mind is like a white linen just returned from the laundry. It takes on the color that you dip it in. Actor, but first it must be sent to the laundry. Master, yes, first is the purification of the mind. Afterward, if you direct the mind to the contemplation of God, it will be colored by God consciousness. Again, if you direct the mind to worldly duties, such as acting of the play, it will be colored by worldliness. Now, there's a few things in here that are really helpful to me. Uh, but one of the one of them that struck me at first, uh, actually, is this idea of longing. Every time I hear anyone talk of this longing that Sri Ramakrishna mentions as being primary for spiritual life, it's always sort of placed outside of our control, like it's not a controlled thing within ourselves, that you either have longing or you don't. And if you don't have it, then you have to have it through devotion. And that's another kind of touchy-feely thing that sort of is beyond our control. And uh, so I feel, I, I hear a lot of people who are practicing talk about this in a way that like, oh, I just don't have this longing or and whatnot. And I, I, I don't I don't like to place things out there in, into that world. I, I really feel like since, you know, the divine is teaching it and asking it, that it's within us that you can have this. And so uh, one of the insights that I was really working on, on trying to, you know, get my own longing and getting my own motivation was this real notion of the separation of the mind from myself. Uh, and, you know, that I only allow myself to say those three things that are true about me using the word I, that I'm loving, that I'm wise, and that I exist. Those are the only three things that can be truthfully said about you. Everything else that you would say about you belongs to either the body or the mind. And so I've stopped using the language of I. When, when, when the body's hungry, I say, oh, the body's hungry. You know, if, if I'm, uh, if the body is, if the mind is angry, I, I said, oh, the mind is angry. And I've really begun working on a practice of using the right language, even in the outside world, to talk about this triad of body, mind, and spirit in the right way, to kind of get it separated in my mind so I can find myself. The self is here, the mind is here, and the body is all this. And uh, it's very important because then you can remind yourself that the mind doesn't have anything to do with you. Uh, and that the things that come up in it are just the things that it's been exposed to. That's what Sri Ramakrishna is saying here. You know, if you go out and expose your mind to particular things, uh, it's going to start desiring those particular things or start of thinking in those particular ways. And uh, <clears throat> that makes it very helpful because then you realize that when the mind is starting to think about whatever, you can remember, oh, the mind is that way because that's what it's been given through the senses. That's what I've been exposing it to. And you can understand that it's not you that is thinking the things that the mind is thinking. So you don't say, oh, uh, you know, I'm feeling this way or that way. You know it's the mind. And it gives you that little bit of wiggle space to choose not to engage. And I've really been working on uh, focusing on that inside, dividing my desires out. I think I've mentioned this before, that no desires come from the heart space. There's no desire there. Everything is there, is as needed. It's perfect. It's the perfect place within you, and it's what you really are. All desires come from either the body or the mind, all of them. And if you really work at keeping that distinction conscious in your, in your own mind, in your own way of seeing, perceiving things, it helps you to, to understand the nature of what you're experiencing. So you aren't just led all the time. You aren't just dragged around by a hook in your nose in this world as desires arise. You feel like, oh, well, what can I do? <laughs> I desire it. 
you know, and uh, so then you go and feed it and that dips your mind in that color again and it becomes brighter and it becomes more defined. So use that distinction of knowing that part of you, the, sh the heart, the shrine where you, you know, if you think of, so you close your eyes, think of someone you love, pay attention to where that love is arising. Where do you feel that bliss, that joy of that love and abstract it out from the object, which will be in your mind to the feeling, which will arise from somewhere in the heart, in the chest area. And then move your focus here and forget the object and enjoy the love. And that's how you can find yourself is one of the easy ways, you know, <laughs> for us in the beginning to get there. And then the thoughts of the mind are colored by what you're experiencing in the world. And, uh, you know, so you can use that to quell your helplessness when it raises up its desires. And by removing the sense of I, you then give yourself some empowerment to understand and say in the face of it, that has nothing to do with me. I'm ever free. I'm ever pure. I'm ever content as it is. So he says that in there and he, and he talks about these different ways of coloring the mind. You know, the actor, when they play a woman on stage, you know, if they do that for a long time, they begin to actually act that way. And, and it becomes part of a habit in a sense. He talks about jaundice coloring the eyes. You, you perceive the world in a different way. Right. If you get involved deeply in politics, the world starts looking a different way. If you spend too much time on the Internet reading all these weird things going on in the world, you begin to see the world that way. And uh, it can be quite troublesome these days. We can really get caught in our echo chambers because that's the way this ridiculous device is being designed by clueless designers who think that's healthy, <laughs> that we only get we only get exposed to ideas that already reinforce ideas that we have, wrong or right, good or bad. We just keep enforcing these ideas. And so all of these fringe things have become central and people are so concerned or so convinced that they're at the center of, of thinking and not realizing that they're off in left field or right field or anywhere else. Uh, you know, so, so it's up to you to dip your mind, expose yourself, to things that are helpful to you to find your inner love, to find your, your unity with others around you, to build compassion, uh, to build all of these things, and to think about divine things, think about grace, think about perfect love, you know, and, and that, that source, which is the divine, which is whatever you think of the divine. You know, all the scripture, all the different scriptures of the different world's traditions will give you a different angle on the on on this divine as a person, or as divine as a self, or as that which is in all things. And all of them are fine. All of them are beautiful. All of them are described as loving, a perfect love. All of them are described as compassionate. All of them are described, uh, you know, in beautiful ways. And and by dipping the mind in that, we find our nature, and it helps us to move forward. And this sending it out to the laundry, this, this purification of the mind, that's just becoming aware of what you're looking at, what you're doing with your days, what you're doing with your time. You know, everything that you take in through your senses, everything is an offering to yourself, to the divine spirit within you. And so you only want to offer things to yourself that are helping you, that create a happy world, that don't lead you into depression, that don't lead you into loneliness, that don't lead you into anger, that don't lead you into these different areas. And to remember that the mind is coloring your world. Very few people, a handful of people in this whole planet probably see the world as it is. All of us have a collection of ideas, of attachments we call them, that are lenses that are causing you to see the world in a particular way. Become aware that that is a lens. Become aware that it belongs to, to a set of glasses, the mind, and that it isn't necessarily what is. And because they're glasses, you can take them off and you can see beyond them. You can see it differently. So when you're caught in those moments of desire, understand they belong to the mind and that they're arising either from the mind or from the body and that they can be changed over time just by what you expose yourself to and understand that they are not connected to you, the self, in any way. That's the delusion. When we get that sense of I mixed up from just here to little pieces of mind and little pieces of body and uh, we get all out of whack. So that, that sense of longing happens at the moment when you're looking at the mind and you get that division and you say, okay, that's, that's the mind. Because I'm not the mind, I'm separate from mind, 
I get an option here. And the longing is simply choosing the option that is helpful to you. That's all longing is. And if you do that enough times, it becomes habitual. And that habitual sadhana is the best kind of practice, the best kind of sadhana. You know, it moves us forward. It moves us toward our ideal. It moves us toward what we want to be and how we want to be remembered. So take all of that, <laughs> put a bow on it, and give it to yourself and see if it helps you. See if it makes you stronger. It certainly has been a great, great lesson for me. And the practice of it has been, been thoroughly great.